put lights on. Can we come down just a little bit? Um, you slide down his Yeah, if that's true. Sure. Is that better for you? It's great for me. You got the book. Okay, let's put the book in the shot. I think that would just be cooler. There you go. Yeah. Wait. Take, take a breath. Are you are you rolling? Rowing? Rolling. Yeah, yeah, we're rolling. Rolling. Uh, okay. I like just rolling where it's more conversation than a formal like. Uh, sure. I think a lot of times like yeah, I could do it. Yeah, yeah. The, the part where it, everything before the microphone gets on is generally the best part. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> so you were um, saying that uh, you did you grow up in. Here? No, here? no, I'm from the Bay Area. You are. Yeah, I'm from where in the Bay Area? San Jose, California. San Jose. Okay. What brought you here? Ah, uh, a few things. One, it was a, a girl. Mm -hmm. At the time, she didn't really want me to come with her. Okay. She, she I was like, hey, you want me to come with you? And she's like, no, not. I don't care. She basically was like, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that kind of hurt. Um, I was living in San Francisco at the time, and I just was. Mm -hmm. I wanted somewhere cheaper. I wanted mm -hmm. somewhere with better weather. I wanted. Okay. More space. And right. I, I, as much as I love tech, I didn't want to talk about computers all day. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about life and just be able to live. And mm -hmm. I came here um, before that. And I was like, man, this is like I felt really. It felt right. Mm -hmm. And so then I yeah I came in 2010 and I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been a lot of changes since 2010, wouldn't you say? I think a lot of things have changed. Yeah. I don't. I think we change and the right, cities change. Right, right. And I think the mindset I've I've kept with Austin. Oh my gosh. No, okay. Should we take it? No. I'm sorry, I thought I turned okay. the, uh, turn um, it off. The city's changed and it's not changed. Like, it was cool back then. Yeah. Was, like, when I got here in 2010, I was like, this place is cool. I'd say the only change that's, you know, we change with it. And I'd rather be the city personally that's either it's growing versus mm -hmm. flat or dying. And the city's yeah. been growing. The only change for me that's been dramatic is just the pricing. Like when I came in 2010, I was like, yo, compared to SF in California, yeah, right. like my, my parents had a house, and just to give an example, in San Jose, California, where, we, where I grew up, the house was uh, 1,400 square feet, like old, really old, 1940s, not nice whatsoever, and it sold for two and a half million. Yeah, I know. It's, just, uh, it's crazy. Just, it's crazy. It's not in like even a, it's in a good neighborhood in near yeah, yeah. you know, This house is two and a half million. Right. And I mean, this is an insane house. Yeah, I can't yeah, believe yeah, how yeah, 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 exactly. I know it's, it's, it's true. And it's really tough on anybody young trying to start there because unless you have some help, your parents, you're not really going to be able to enter the market, so to speak. But um, <clears throat> yeah, the you, you're right. We change. Everything's changing, and being adaptable to change is a great life skill today. So it, it's a good practice. It, it, how do you think people can adapt to change or be more open to change? <clears throat> and I guess even the question about it is be ready for change. Yeah, ready for change. That's really good. Um, I think, you know, honestly, I think it starts when you're very young. I think we, we, we can train. I think it's a skill. Let me put it that way. Obviously, some people are more temperamentally disposed to it, but everybody can get better at it. And I think it's a skill that we can, get, we can be trained from when we're small. I, one of the things that... Um, I spent a lot of time doing after high school was travel and travel for me it was like perpetual change right you're constantly moving into new environments having to adapt learn new things um, and then come back to the same place and see it change and so there was um, there was kind of no better school for change than to be traveling. Maybe a little closer. Otherwise, okay. might not pick up on you. Sure. Well, take the, the, let me let's step back to to your story. For the people uh, that may not know you, and, mm -hmm. and this is just for YouTube. So for sure. YouTube, it's basically like thirty seconds or less. So like, who is Kevin Kelly for people sure. that may not know? So um, I'm Kevin Kelly. I'm one of the co-founders of Wired Magazine. Although I published and edited magazines before that. Um, and since Wired, I've gone on to write books about the culture of technology. And I'm also um, 
co-chairman of the Low Now Foundation, where we've been building a clock in West Texas that's 500 feet inside a mountain and would tick for 10,000 years to help people, <laughs> remind people to think generationally and to be a good ancestor. And then you're, I would say you're also known for the, the Thousand True Fans. So the, my most popular piece of writing has been the Thousand True Fans essay, which I did and then revised. Um, but I first wrote it before there was Kickstarter or Patreon and it advocated basically um, a way of having your true fans support you to make a living and how that if you had direct contact with those fans you didn't need millions of them you needed thousands of them how do you think someone should live the different decades of their life so like you you dropped out of college and it's not like you traveled mm -hmm. how do you think uh, people should reflect on and now that you can look back on that so the wonderful thing about modern life, what technology gives us, is an increasing choices and options. And I think, you know, what I did is not necessarily what I think everybody should do. It's a wonderful option and choice to have for those to whom it might work. But there are other people who um, might want to continue to study and stay in school, and that would be perfectly fine. And that's a fabulous option if they have that. And there are others you may not even want to go to high school, and that's an option too these days. And so, um, uh, I think what's really, really great is is that we have as many choices that we that we do. We want to have even more choices, um, and so um, I find traveling the option of traveling to be so powerful that I think it should be subsidized by governments. For the young, because there's nothing that would really transform, say, America more than if every young person under 21 had a chance to travel outside and meet other people and understand that we have probably far more in common with others than we have differences. So, for when you're in your 20s, travel. What do you think in 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? Again, I, you know, I, I, I don't. That's a very Hindu way of of seeing things. Where they have these kind of like you know you're a student and then you have these four phases or five phases passages. I, I you know I, I I I don't I don't see it that way. I, I don't think our I don't think we have sort of a natural um, phases. I guess maybe that's the only word I know. I mean there is something about it's probably good to have kids when you're not a teenager and not. Maybe not even in your 20s, I don't know, but many people do and they're perfectly, it's great. If you want to have a lot of kids, you should start early. I guess I would say that. And I think, by the way, you should have as many kids as you can. Um, there'll be no regrets. No, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no regrets. And so, um, uh, yeah, if you want to have a family, maybe starting early is a good idea if you want to have a lot of kids, but for some people, that's it's not a choice, it's not an option, and that's fine too. So I don't, I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I, I'm kind of resisting this idea that, that when you're 20s, you, you're teens, you're studying, 20s, you travel, 30s, you make a business. Well, I, I don't, I don't see the life that way. How do you see it? Well, again, I think <clears throat> I spent most of my young adult life in Asia among very traditional societies, in some cases in a time machine, living in the past, in the 1500s, in places like northern Afghanistan or even the Himalayas, where life had not changed in centuries. And the, the, the life that the people were living was in many ways admirable and, and wonderful. Beautiful architecture, strong communities, very certain identities, but the difficulty was they had no choice in what they were. If you're a guy, you're going to be a farmer, basically. If you were a woman, you were going to be a wife and a mother. That was it. That was a choice. You could have been a genius. You could have been a math genius. It didn't matter. You, were going to, you had no choice. And they moved to the cities in order to get that choice. That's what they got in the cities, even though the cities were less beautiful than their real village. 
And that's what modern life and technology gives us, is these choices. And so I see life as a, a meandering path where we each are trying to figure out what our purpose in life is. And so our purpose in life is to figure out what our purpose in life is. And that <laughs> seems, like a, it seems like a paradox, but that is the way. That is the way. And you will probably, will spend most of our life on that seeking journey. And for anybody who has accomplished anything remarkable, their path is full of detours, right turns, turnarounds, diversions. It's not a straight line for anybody. And the more remarkable you are, the less that's going to be a straight line. And so that path is a path to get to the point where, uh, where you can say, on the day before you die, I fully become myself. That's what you're trying to figure out, is to become yourself. And that is a very high bar, and that's a very long path, and it takes a lot of people to kind of figure out, what is, what, what is it that I am best at? What, what is it that I'm good at? What is it that I am better at than most people? So my little bit of advice in this book that I just wrote was, don't try to be the best. Try to be the only. The only is what you want to be seeking. Because you have a different face than everybody else, and you have a different mix of talents and abilities and geniuses. And what would be perfect is if your genius, your particular distinctive genius, could be unleashed to the world. And that's a very high bar to get to to be able to do things that only you can do. And I truly believe everybody on the planet has something, some, excuse me, some, some place where they can be doing something that only they can do. And so, um, so that's what I see life as. It's this journey where you are headed not in that kind of set number of phases, but you are on a destination that only you can get to. I love that. <clears throat> what, what, how did you find and what, is, what did you realize is your purpose here? Yeah. So, I'm 70 and a half and I'm still figuring out. <laughs> so if, if <laughs> at, at, at every, at every, and by the way, I've had the privilege and honor to hang around with some very accomplished people, famous people, billionaires. And the amazing thing is that they're, they're also um, still figuring out what they want to do when they grow up. It's really, really remarkable. You know, having a billion dollars does not answer that question. And so, um, I'm still trying. To, I'm still on my way and figuring out what it is. So I have some idea. I have a lot better idea than I did before. And part of what I um, am good at is, is better than most. Is um, I'm a very good um, theorizer, making theories, frameworks. I'm a very good um, uh, uh, question asker, which is sort of one of the things you want in, you know. Uh, writing, writing and uh, interviewing. And then I have a really good, I think a very good nose for things that are at the frontier and that could potentially be uh, powerful and potent later on. So kind of a, uh, a, a, a really good sense of, of frontiers, of, of being able to, and being comfortable on the frontiers and then translating that into um, ordinary language, and so, um, and so those are the the kinds of skills, and that combination of skills. And that's again, that's the thing. We don't really have unique skills; we just have unique combinations of skills that um, are, are is what I am good at. And so, one of the things um, that I learned that I wish I had known earlier, which is the title of my book, is, is that. Um, this idea of be the best, don't be the best, be the only, but the, um, the idea that for many people, the, the holy trinity of the apex of, of like say career is 
you want to get to the point where you um, love what you're doing, you're really good at what you're doing, and you get paid well to what you're doing. And for most people, if they can reach that overlapping three circles of loving what you're doing, you're really good at it, and you get paid well for it. It's like, that's like, that's perfect. But actually, what I figured out and learned was that there's actually a fourth level. There's another level above that that's even better. And that is, is once you have those three, what you find out is that you begin to have more opportunities that meet that criteria than you can do. And really where you want to move to is the fourth level, which is, yeah, but can anybody else do that? Here's a project, here's an idea for a book, here's a movie, here's uh, um, you know, a, a startup um, that I would be good at, that I would love doing, that I paid well for, it. but 10 other people could do that. There's one over here that only I can do. That's where I go to now because that's how I can have the most impact. That's, that's me. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to do the things that only I can do. And so being able to figure out that is a very high bar. It, 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 we're opaque to ourselves. It just takes an incredible amount of introspection and having feedback from other people and looking at what the universe is saying. You're never going to be able to tell, well, what is it that only I can do? But it is a question that I ask now when, I, when there is an opportunity, which is... Um, not just whether it's something I would enjoy that I'd be good at and get paid for it, but the question is, could anybody else do this? Because if someone else can do it, it's like, I'm not going to do it. For someone, uh, before this, what if, what's a story or two that comes to mind when you reflect on your time traveling uh, in your in the early 20s when you were in Asia? Sure. And it, you were traveling in Asia when it wasn't like... There was no Airbnb. <laughs> like, right, right. there's like a paper map. You know, I don't know, paper maps. There were not paper maps. Yeah. So, what are some of those stories? Yeah, yeah, that come yeah, to yeah. Mind? But, but let me just make a concluding uh, remark about what I just said about uh, being the only and, and finding what only you can do. Everything I said also applies to a business, meaning that um, I think businesses are. Ex extensions and expressions of, of the personalities of the founders. And um, businesses should also be looking for the things that only they can do. It's, it's the same thing. It's like, yes, it's like, yeah, it, that'd be cool. You make a lot of money doing that and, and, and it'd be good. Um, but can anybody else do it? Are there other businesses doing it? And then when you're in that space, of it, it's beautiful and wonderful because you don't have any competition at that point. If you're actually doing things that only you can do, it's great. And so that was what the fantastic thing about Wired was. And, uh, because for the first decade, there was no competition. Literally no competition. We were the only magazine. In fact, that was the great selling point for the ads. It was like, there's nobody else talking to the nerds. There is nobody else who's catering to these people who have great amount of money. And so, um, so we had it to ourselves because it was like it was we were the only, not just the best. So anyway, um, I thought that was I think that's important to kind of understand that it applies not just to individuals but even to organizations. So, traveling um, again, I was lucky. I, I, I was lucky that I could travel at this transitional moment in the early nineteen seventies. When a person like me who had no money, I mean like so little money, would have the ability to go to places that even just 10 years earlier would have required an expedition and lots of money and planning. But now I could get on a Jeep, I could find a Jeep or maybe even a local bus to take me there. And there were still intact traditional societies that had not been modernized at all. And um, for very little money, I could be there when, you know, 20 years, th even 20 years later, it was very easy to get to, but already they were changing. They were more, much more modern and they were not as intact. 
So, so there was this, this, this special decade, almost, when places like Afghanistan or Nepal or Yemen or any of these other places, there were really intact medieval cultures. Like, for instance, Kathmandu, I, could take a, I took a bus from India for five dollars. I could take an overnight bus and go over to the foothills and arrive in Kathmandu in the morning, and it was like, literally like a time machine, because here was a city of, I don't know, maybe 500,000 people that had no vehicles. It was a pedestrian city. They didn't even have uh, bicycles. It was just, it was, it was a pedestrian city without vehicles for the most part. And it just, it was medieval and it was just incredible. So um, what I learned from all that was the importance of, again, of technology and what we get from it, the costs and the advantages of having choices and having abilities. But I have to say that it was, you know, a, a real privilege to be able to experience that at that time. Any what were you looking for out there? And then for yeah. someone starting out in their career, what, what advice do you have for them? So what I was looking for, and, and I was young, and um, I was r reveling in the otherness and in, 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 in the differences. And um, I was I had an assignment, a self-assignment to photograph. I, you know, was, when I left, uh, I was probably maybe 20 years old. And I, um, on my first trip, this was my sec second trip, on the first trip in 1972, I was going to go to Taiwan and uh, Japan, and I called up, I found the phone number of National Geographic in their, mag in their phone book, and I called up National Geographic and asked for the photo editor, and I said, I'm going to Japan and Taiwan, do you need any photographs? You know, I'm just like a high school kid. And so the, the photo editor was very, very gracious. He said, you know, well, it doesn't really kind of work that way. But what, when you come back, show me your work and you know, we'll take it from there. And I did. And he was very, very welcoming. Again, I'm just a kid off the street. But photography was, was, was not common then. I mean, it took to be a photographer, I started off, you know, you have to develop all the chemicals and the, everything yourself and make all the prints. You need to know chemistry and optics and stuff, and it was, it was very technical. And so um, uh, I took 500 rolls of film in my backpack, and I took two rolls of film uh, a day, which was, um, there were 36, it was like 72 pictures every day. And when I would tell normal people, that I took 72 pictures a day, they would be in disbelief. They would say, that is this literally, how could you take so many pictures in one day? We had a camera in my family, it was a little brownie camera for my parents, and they would do one roll of film a year, 24 exposures, one a year. So there'd be a picture like a you know, Christmas or presents, there'd be one of somebody's birthday, 24 a year. I built a nature museum in my basement, and there was not a single photograph of that. You know, this is like, so, so the photography was in a very different mode when I was there. And I was there in Asia to photograph this, these differences, this amazing things. I was using color, slide film, just amazing spectacles and people in costume. It was, it was vanishing before my eyes. And I was on a hunt to seek out the most intact remote areas and there was no information. There was very little information about where this was. There was, I was in areas where there were no guidebooks, there were no maps. I would sometimes take a bus to the next town having literally no idea what might be there. And most of the time it was very boring. It's a very inefficient way to travel because I have no idea what's there. There's no, I've never, there's just nothing known to me about where to go. So the state, I mean, not only was there no Airbnb, there was no internet, there were no maps, there were very few books, in some places no books. What we'd have is um, 
there occasionally were places to stay, and there would be a guest book, and guests would write about what their favorite place was, where they had just come from, and whether it was whether they liked it, and you're reading guest books to kind of figure out where to go next. And so, you, for someone just starting in their career, what advice would you have for them? So. I have a couple of pieces of advice for someone starting their career. First of all, I would say, um, if at all possible, try and work in a place where they don't have a name for what it is that you're doing. Where there's no language for what it is. Where it takes a little bit to kind of try to explain to your mother what it is that you do. This is a really good place to be. For one thing, you won't have any competition. Secondly, um, that's much more likely where, where, where breakthroughs and new things begin. So, like, imagine if 10 years ago or something you were doing something, like, you say, well, um, it's kind of like radio, but it's not quite radio. It's this thing, it's kind of like an audio documentary. Yeah, I don't know. They call it podcasting. So, um, there'll be new frontiers be, that are in front of language now, and that's, that's a really good sign, if, you, if you're ahead of the language, that means that you're in a very fruitful place. So the second thing I would say for a young person, 20 year olds, is if at all possible, spend a bunch of time, a year or maybe more, doing something that looks nothing like success. It should be crazy, unpredictable, offbeat, weird, unprofitable, um, you know, demented, frivolous, you know, um, a waste of time, all these things. You want to spend some time doing things that look nothing like success because that will become your touchstone and something you return to and a foundation to build success on later on. So how did leading, because you, you walked around these really unique countries at that time, very mm -hmm. unique. I don't know if people can realize how that is. Like, I went to somewhere, I went to Thailand in 2004, which, and even in that time, it was pretty wild. But how did that lead you to, to find, to co-founding Wired Magazine? And what was that, what was that? Yeah, so, so, so I'm highly unqualified to be doing what I'm doing, and that's another piece of advice is, <laughs> you should always uh, apply for jobs that you're unqualified for, right? Because you want to be stretched, you want, you want to learn. Um, so, uh, I... Yeah, the, the, again, it's hard to convey how alien, how different the world was, particularly Asia, where I was traveling uh, in the 70s. And um, part of my optimism comes from the fact that I've seen those, those places change right before my eyes. Um, you know, places like Taiwan, or whatever, where which, which went from third world developers to creating some of the most futuristic cities in the world. An amazing journey for, for those countries. But um, my own path to Wired was, um, I the only place I ever wanted to work was the Whole Earth Catalog, which was started by Stuart Brand in 69. And I saw an early version of the catalog, and it just blew my mind because it was uh, there was no internet, at the time, and to find out any kind of information about anything was literally like impossible. Uh, the bookstores were horrendously poor with a very small selection of books. There were no Barnes and Nobles. It's like local bookstores, like there were some bestsellers, and the, the libraries had nothing to, they didn't have books on how to pan for gold, or how to build your own home, or anything you might be, that might be useful. Where would you find these? There were books that were being published by small presses, but how would you ever find them? That's what the whole Earth Catalog was. It was directing people to these obscure things about access to tools, things that you could do yourself. And when I discovered that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is me, this is what I'm all about. And the, re the way it was written, it was a user-generated content. The readers sent in the, the material, which Stuart immediately published really quickly on cheap newsprint and sent it out without ads. It was subscriber supported. It was like, this is genius. So I wanted to be part of it, but I had nothing whatsoever. 
I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, and I knew nothing. I had no, I had no extra information. But after traveling in um, Asia for all those years, I suddenly knew more about budget travel than anybody. And I met these other people who were self-publishing these little guidebooks to these areas. And one was a guy named Rick Steve, who was had a book called um, Europe Through the Back Door. And then there was another guy named um, uh, Tony and uh, Maureen Wheeler who had a, a little thing called Lonely Planet. They had like, a Lonely Planet <laughs> shoestring guy. And I would import it. And there was Bill Dalton who was doing the Indonesian guys and he was at Moon Publications. And so, so I started to import and I had a little business review, uh, importing these and selling these books by mail order and then reviewing them for the whole earth catalog. I was like the nomadics travel guy because I, I knew and I was seeing these things. So for the first time, I had something to share in this kind of utilitarian, practical way. And that brought me inside the um, whole earth catalog world. And then this in the around 1980, the bulletin boards started. And I, I got, um, I got a, I used, I was working at the University of Georgia in a, in a lab, and I, there was, had an Apple IIe to, to do some of the lab, uh, number crunching, and it had a modem, and I figured out that I could um, use that modem to take my typewriter word processor stuff and send it to a local newspaper to have it printed out for my catalog. So it looked really professional. So I would type it and send it to them through the modem. And the modem, I discovered, was this new portal to this emerging online world. And I decided to treat it like it was a new country. And I was going to explore it and start to write about it as a new country. And I did a cover story for the New Age magazine on the Network Nation whatever it was, in the 80, early 80s, saying that this is like a new territory, a new continent, and I took the same travel approach to it. But I saw something there that changed my ideas about technology, because I was a kind of a hippie, keeping technology at arm's length. I owned a bicycle and a camera and almost nothing else. And so uh, I, I was not a fan of technology. I was not interested in it, really. But here was something, this marriage of the phone and the computer together, this telecommunications, I felt it was like very organic, it was like almost Amish in some ways. It felt really powerful and appropriate and, and community-minded. And so I was really going into a deep reporting on it. And then um, I was hired at, at, at Whole Earth to, to help with the software catalog. And I read a book called The Hackers by Stephen Levy, and I had this idea of bringing the hackers together for the first time, and then we got involved in making a, a, a portal to the internet, the emerging internet, and we made the first online access to the internet in 84. So I had been living online for 10 years, even before Wired started, but that's sort of what my interest was, was from the community side of it. And so when the opportunity for Wired came along, which I can explain, it was um, a natural progression of um, not anything theoretical. I think this, it was like, no, I, I was living online for 10 years, more than 10 years, before Wired came along. And I knew that this was going to be the kind of the major mode of where we were going, just from my experience. And so, um, uh, when, when Lewis and Jane, who are the main co-founders of Wired, were making this magazine, I, I already knew them and were, were fans of them for another magazine they worked. Um, Lewis had two, two things that he said to me that kind of convinced me to, to, to um, work for Wired, or to start Wired. He says, I want to make a magazine that feels like it's been mailed back from the future. 
I said, oh, man, sign me up. The other thing he did was I had been doing a magazine that was about conceptual news, and it was talking about all the stuff. But it was talking about the ideas of it, which I like and I'm very attracted to. And Lewis says, yeah, yeah, I know, but I want to take these ideas, I want to wrap around people. So I want people on the cover. I don't want ideas on the cover. I want people on the cover. I want to make stars out of the nerds. I want to make the nerds and new heroes. I said, okay, I'm going to work on this thing. <laughs> this is like, this, this can work. Well, it does tie back to your earlier thing about going in different paths and exploring your right, curiosity. Right, right, right. And then not, everyone is not, everyone's unique-ish, but it's the combination of uniqueness. Right. Um, Wired did go public for almost half a billion. No. Did, er, didn't it, it failed. Public? I thought it Wired's went. IPO failed. That's that's why we sold it. So Wired was going to go public. With we invented the we had a whole we invented the web banner click through ad banner that was a Wired invention. We were going to we had our own search engine. We had all these properties and we had Goldman Sachs and we were did a roadshow for IPO and we were going to become this. We probably would have been the Google because we were already doing ads long before Google was. And we had a search engine. But the IPO failed during the dot-com. And, and that disaster, of the failed IPO, kicked into all kinds of things. And we had to sell the magazine and, and the, the online version of it. So, no, it did not IPO. What, what did it end up selling for? Well, we sold the magazine to Connie Nest. And then the, uh, the, uh, and, and, and we sold the online version to um, Lycos. Um, which was then sold to Tofanka and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, 10 years later, Connie Ness bought it back for, for pennies. Because there were, cause during that time period, during the whole aughts, Wired Magazine did not have Wired.com. It had no online presence whatsoever. It was prohibited from having an online presence. Totally screw up. So, um, so no, it, it, it never went public. And then did you make a lot of money or not a lot of money? No, so I, I sold it to, uh, we sold it to Connie Nass in around 2000. I had 1% as a founder, just 1% of the sale. So no, it was not uh, very much money, but it was more money as a hippie than I ever expected to do, to do it. And so um, um, it, it was not enough to retire, but it was you know, enough for college for kids, basically. Were you disappointed? No, not at all. as I said, not at all. Actually, here's the thing. When we were going, there was a finance guy doing all the shares, and I made a bet with him that I would never see any money from Wired. <laughs> because starting a magazine is like starting a restaurant. The, the, the chances of it succeeding and making money are very, very low. And so while I was fully there, I was just being realistic and saying, you know, I'm not here for, basically, I'm not here for the money. I, I'll bet you a dinner in Barcelona, this is Rex's uh, bet, that, that I never see any money from here, but that's okay, because I'm not expecting it. So when, when it did sell to, to, to Condé Nast, um, see, 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 the magazine sold at kind of magazine prices. The, every, what everybody wanted was the digital side, because that, that was the internet valuation, which we didn't get the part of that, okay? So, so, so we didn't get the internet valuation, we just got the magazine valuation, which was not very much. But it was, again, more than I thought I'd ever have. So you, you mentioned during that time you met a lot of interesting people, a right. lot of billionaires, and yep, yep. smart people, rich people, I'm guessing like Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. any stories you can share, or things you've learned? You said, Well, yeah, he was pretty much a jerk. He was a genius jerk. Um, that's another piece of advice I have. Is don't work for someone you don't want to become. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, um, he was ranting. I interviewed him uh, one time when he worked at, was at Next. And this has actually been thrown out, fired by his own startup for being incompetent. It was at Next, which was headed before he bought Pixar, it was headed to be like a failure. And I walked away from 
the, the interview with him where he was ranting about design and stuff and he just was very uh, cantankerous and I thought we're never going to hear from this guy again of course I was totally wrong right I mean he this is he bought Pixar after that and then went back to Apple and did everything I was totally wrong but but I, I just I thought he was just completely out of it and not making sense and very arrogant and anyway so I was wrong by a mile so uh, other I mean celebrities uh, greatness is overrated you don't want to be great really great Greatness is an extremity. You, you have to be so extreme to have people remember your name after you're gone. And that extremity comes at a cost to other parts of your personality. And if you're extreme over here, you, that means you're going to be extreme in this corresponding direction. And so, so w w the great the people who consider great have great weaknesses. That's the, that's the kind of the trade-off. And so, um, you know, Steve was great in many ways, but greatly horrible in corresponding ways, and that's really clear. So, um, yeah, and, and by the way, I, I, I don't know, again, I don't have a good sense of your listeners, but I will tell you right now that you really don't want a billion dollars. You do not want a billion dollars. You shouldn't have a billion dollars. Yeah, be rich, that's fine. But when you get to the billion, it's a burden. Every single, it's just a burden. It warps things. It's, it's just a huge burden. You don't, it's more money you can really spend, so it becomes this burden. And if you have multi-billions, it's an incredible weight and incredible distraction and incredible distortion. You just don't need it. How much do you think people should have? Well, so I, I like Warren Buffett's uh, uh, terminology because he was talking about what he was going to pass on to his kids. And that's another where it really kind of distorts things with your children. But he says, I, I, I want to give my kids um, enough that they can do whatever they want, but not so much that they do nothing. So that's my answer is how much is it? Well, whatever it takes for you to do what you want. And you don't need a billion dollars to do what you want. That's what I'm saying. There's a great scene in, in, a, in a movie, I can't remember which one of it is, um, where the guy is going to Wall Street and he's talking about, you know, there's something about, you know, the, the, the stresses and the craziness of Wall Street. He says, well, I'm only here because I want to make, I want to I, I, I make my, you know, my fortune whatever so I can buy a motorcycle and ride across China. And all the travelers just laugh hysterically. Because you could do that for like $5,000. You could quit, take 5000 you could work at McDonald's for a year and save enough money to buy a cheap motorcycle to ride across China. You don't need to make a billion dollars to do that. And so most of the things in your life, people think that they need a lot of money for, but they don't. They need time for it. They need other things. And... Um, if, you know, and most of the breakthroughs in the world are not from money. If, if, if money was the really scarce resource for invention, then the billionaires would be inventing everything. But they're not. Because the, most of the key inventions and innovations come because you don't have money. You're forced. You can't buy the solution. So you have to invent it with ingenuity and gumption and everything else. Which is why most of the inventions come from startups. Because they don't have money. If they had money, they would just try and buy the solution. But they have to invent it because they don't have it. So the poor, in some senses, have all the ingredients you need for great innovation. And so what's preventing most people from doing things is not money. It's time. Time, ingenuity. Time, time dedication, brilliant. Desperation. You know, desperation. <laughs> um, cleverness. Patience, all kinds of things. It's, so, 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 so that's something that I have learned in, in, in that um, uh, I'm, you know you need luck too. I have to say, 
if you want to, if you want to really, if you really want to become great, you also need luck. And I admire the people who are very successful who acknowledge the role of luck in their lives. Warren was lucky. We, we were at the right time. If we were a little earlier, it wouldn't have worked. If we were later, there would have been competition. But we were lucky at the right time. And um, I've heard Jeff Bezos talk about the role of luck and what's happened to him. It's, he was lucky. And I admire that because he, he acknowledges the role of luck. And I don't admire the people who think that they've accomplished these things in some way all by themselves. It's just, it's just so untrue that, 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 and so different from reality that I question, I question it. Either they're just not being serious or what. Um, I mean, I, when you say lucky, like, the way I heard it was humility, right? Like they're yeah. realizing there's things going on. I mean, even thinking about my own company or some of the stuff I've done, it's right. like, I'm not self made. It's been a lot of, people crossing paths exactly. and things working out. Yep. I gotta ask, you also worked uh, closely with Steven Spielberg. You like working with guys named Steve, it seems like. <laughs> or uh, meeting them. I guess, what was it, how was it to interact with him? I only had interaction with one weekend, so I don't really know him. Um, the premise was very simple, which is he was um, doing this new movie called Minority, Minority Report, which was a science fiction, and he convened a bunch of people, including myself and others, to help him imagine that world in 2050 that was the setting for the movie, Minority Report. And our job, so we, so we were at a hotel in Venice, Shutter's Hotel, I think it was, for like a weekend or so, and our job was to help him map out a, a vision of what a kind of a plausible world would be like in 2050. So there was a bunch of people, including myself, who who worked together with with each other to do scenarios for the future. That was sort of the business. It was called GBN, Global Business Network. And GBN was a boutique consultancy that specialized in doing future scenarios. So we were doing, we weren't doing a formal scenario for this movie because he only wanted one and usually scenarios are done in, in multiples, but um, the same, we're using some, some of the same kind of, um, what's the word I want, exercises to, to kind of brainstorm. And so, um, so I, yeah, so I was part of that group that was kind of designing, and some of the suggestions um, appeared on the screen eventually, and um, uh, I think the thing that I learned from Spielberg I said I don't know that was really helpful was um, there's a tendency among futurists like myself to kind of wave our arms and talk about things in general trends and stuff and he didn't want any of that he was like no 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 it's a, like what do they have for breakfast in 2050 like um, what do the beds look like um, how about the music so it was very, very, very specific. He was not interested in trends and generalities. He wanted to know specifically, tell me what it is so I can film it, basically. And I thought that was really cool and refreshing because I've not really encountered that before. What were some of the exercises to think about the future? So, the hardest part about thinking about the future is kind of to forget your expectation of what it should look like. <laughs> Because it's going to be it's going to be surprising and unreasonable in a certain sense, and that is that we we laugh at that, but that actually is the most difficult part is to. We call it in the scenario business the official future is 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 to get beyond the official future, the kind of expected future, and um, um, one thing is to. Um, to start sort of way ahead in some impossible place and to then to work back and say, well, let's imagine that this could happen. How could we get there? What would it take to get to that point? So it's not the end point that's interesting. It's the in-between steps. And those steps are often the genesis of something that 
is useful and important later on. So I think, okay, like, well, we have, um, uh, you know, um, uh, a robot president, okay? I'm just saying, there's some future we've got a robot president. Well, okay, that's interesting and strange, but, but like, what happened, like, 20 years before that? What was the thing before the robot president? Did you have a robot vice president? Was it like a robot CEOs? I mean, there had to you can't just jump from nothing to a robot president. There has to be all these intermediates, and those intermediates are often the places where the the real the real juice is. So you have this kind of intermediate thing. Another one is we call unthinkables, and that is where you again you kind of think of impossible things that you could kind of imagine, and then you play around with it. It's like you know, it's like okay, like we we kind of know that. Um, uh, burnt meat is actually carcinogenic. I mean, it has, that that burnt stuff has a lot of carcinogens. So what if what if a barbecue became outlaw, right? And so like, what would happen then? And so you can kind of imagine, you know, underground barbecue places and this kind of like <laughs> prohibition of barbecue, whatever it is. And so you can kind of like start to play around with these what we call unthinkables. So that's another trick exercise. Um, the, 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 a really common thing to help people was to, again, to imagine something and start to write a news story or a press release based on that idea. And again, you're trying to fill it out. In that, in that process of filling it out, you get new ideas and concepts and can, how it can be integrated with other things that you're also thinking of. So, so there's, there's a whole handful of little tricks. That's that. cool. Yeah. Uh, what opportunities do you see for a lot of our audience is underdogs, what we call them, and they yeah. want to start businesses and be entrepreneurs. Like, right. What opportunities are you seeing today or in the future for them to, to start creating? Well, I have a little rant about this. This can maybe be a pep talk, but it's, it says, you know, um, in 25 to 30 years from now, the things that we will all talk about, like we're talking about AI these days, the thing that we're going to be all talking about in 25 or 30 years and the thing that everybody will have and everybody will want, the major, and the thing that will be dominant in the culture are things that don't exist today at all. They're not even here. They haven't been invented. I'm, so I'm saying the major thing has not been invented today. So first of all is you're not late. Okay? You think... All the internet stuff is done, we, we're just starting the internet. All the AI stuff is done, we, have, we don't have AI yet. There are, no AI expert, there are no AI experts, as viewed from 30 years, they'll say, well, back then in 2023, you didn't have any AI experts because you didn't have AI. So you're not late. So that's the first thing I would say. So the frontiers are actually continuing to expand. There's more opportunities now today than there were even 10 years ago. The tools are more available. There's still more money around than ever before. Um, it's and most of the really great things have not been invented. So this is like the per this is the best time in the world ever to be starting something. How does someone? What I admire about you is you found the areas that you're interested in. Like I'm curious about the future. I'm curious about theories. I'm curious about tech. How does someone make a living of that? Because I think what I admire is that you found something you like, and you're like, you actually turned it into a career. Right. And I was like, how, how do you actually make money doing it? Especially right, when right, you right. said you make a lot of wire. I was like, oh, is it as a writer? And then how can other people right, right, right. learn from that? So, so for a long time, my major source of income, my livelihood, was giving talks in China. Um, Most of my fans were in China. Uh, much more well-known in China than here. And that's a, that was a kind of a curious, again, curious, lucky thing. Um, but, the, um, but the truth is that, you know, books don't really make very much money. It's the speaking fees, the appearances. Of, and this goes back to the piece I wrote about Better Than Free. Uh, I, I wrote, I don't know, 20 years ago. That we're moving into this area where, where things become free. You know, everything's in it for free. So, like, what's better than free? So, better than free is like, um, if you wait long enough, you can get a 
copy of you can get you can hear music for free. But like if you had a really band that you followed, you might pay for the immediacy for getting it first before other people. So you're not really paying for the music, you're paying for the immediacy. Or let's say sticking with music, you have acoustical thugs. You could have music that you could get generically, but what if that music was tailored to the acoustics of your living room? Then it's personalization. You're paying for the personalization, not for the music. Or, with, like with NFTs, you can get something for free, but you're paying for the signature, you're paying for the authenticity, you're a patron. So this, these are all better than free. And one of the other better than free is, is, yeah, you can watch my talk online, but if you want me physically present to have that face-to-face, -face, you're going to pay for that presence. And so that's my economy was, was being present, having physically go somewhere. That radically changed with COVID. You know, most of us, all the speaking stopped during COVID and even... China has not resumed. So um, people will pay a little bit for you to appear in Zoom, but the physicality is obviously not there and it seems kind of for free. So um, uh, so we'll see what happens with, with that. But I do have, you know, I have a little media empire with books and the website, and podcasts and newsletters. And um, that's kind of more of a, you know, the, with the little, we have, I have one full-time assistant and have a partner with the um, Cool Tools. So that's, we use Amazon affiliates and now we have, uh, we, we call unclassified ads and the newsletters. And they, they produce what I would call, kind of like you call like a lifestyle business, right? It's, it's kind of like a, you know, it's a mom and pop level of a business. And so, um, and that's fine for, for me um, because, um, I'm not trying to maximize the amount of money that I have. I, I, I've never been interested in that. I, I'm much more interested in sort of um, maximizing audience or engagement and um, you know fans. And, and 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 my real goal is to maximize the amount of learning that we all can do, because I want to increase the amount of technology in the world so that every person born and yet unborn would have a chance to express their genius and um, share with us what only they can do. So, so, so I'm, I'm, you know, I have, over the years, I still have enough to do what I want to do, which is, you don't need that much money to do that. Um, people, you know, to figure, I ask my kids this all the time. I ask their friends to say, okay, what would you do with a billion dollars? Just tell me what you, I'm going to give you a billion dollars and do tell me what you want to do with it. And, you know, okay, maybe someone buys a house. Okay, you have to buy a house. You haven't spent anything of the billion dollars to buy the house. You still have a billion dollars. And when you're a billionaire, everything is free. Okay, I understand that. When you're a billionaire, everything is free. So everything is free. Now what are you going to do? Well, you know, maybe I go to Thailand or something. Good. You don't need a million dollars to go to Thailand. You can go next year. So, 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 so once you have this thing where you have a billion dollars and ask them what they're going to do, it's amazing how small what it is that they want to do is. They don't need that. That's the whole exercise. It's like, okay, you, all the things you've told me are attainable with nothing remotely like a billion dollars. And so, um, money is just overrated as far as your dreams are concerned. About that. Yeah. Speaking of money, uh, I, you have this book, Excellent Advice for Living, right. Wisdom I Wish I Known Earlier. I've read your, have you put out two or at least one about wisdom you've learned in seven years? Three. I've done three years and this, that was the genesis for, for this. This now has 450 of them, um, but it does include most of the ones that I posted online when I, on my birthday. And I want to say that one specifically, because I, mean, I want to talk about the book and some mm -hmm. of the things in it, is that the one for me that, that changed the way, I think what's interesting is when someone listens to the podcast or reads a book or a tweet or whatever it is and they actually change their behavior. Yes. Wow. Right, right. So for me, 
your one that said was about money, which is if you listen to a street performer for <laughs> longer than a minute, you give them a dollar. You give them a dollar. <laughs> right. And I, you know, I was in Barcelona for the, for yeah. the winter, and I'm like, got to give this guy a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I really it felt good, right? It felt damn good. It felt yeah. damn good. And I, and I really appreciated that you yeah, put yeah. that one out there. So in your book. So, so, I, so I, as much as possible, I tried to get some kind of practical things that would change people's behavior. And the origins of the book is that I like to take lots of kind of advice and stuff, and I like to boil it down to something that I could repeat to myself so I could change my own behavior. Mm. So I, I see these a little handle. I make a little handle out of this stuff by putting it into a little treatable, rehearsable, repeatable maxim for myself. And, and I, I, one would be like um, the change my own life was um, if I get invited to do a talk or go visit somebody or have coffee or um, start any kind of a thing uh, I always ask myself would I do this if it was tomorrow morning okay, it's, you know they're saying six months from now do you want to have do you want to meet do you want to come give this talk or whatever it is it's like would I do this if it was tomorrow morning do I want to do this if it was tomorrow morning and in most cases the answer is no so I say no at that time. It's just a way of kind of this immediacy filter where you're kind of like, this is, this is what's really important. And that has really changed my, my, my calendar. It's like, okay, that's, that sounds nice, but what would I do if it was tomorrow morning? Okay, and so that's one kind of a practical bit of advice that I could reduce down into a little bit of something. Another example would be um, if I have lost track of something in my house, and I know that I have it, but I can't find it, and I eventually find it, I repeat to myself, as I'm putting it back away, don't, don't put it back where you found it, put it back where you first looked for it. I love that one. And that's changed my behavior, and I repeat that to myself all the time. And yeah, what I wrote down here as well, it's got a lot of wisdom, is whenever the choice between being right and yeah. being kind, be kind. And yeah, no exceptions, don't confuse kindness right. with weakness. I, I, I did read the book, most of it last night, and I uh, read your online article. Yes. Um, I think what I was struggling with is that there's so much in there. I'm like, oh, I have to be kind here, and I have to ask more. I have to ask questions three times. I got to go seven times sometimes, and then I've got to give to street performers. And so, yeah. you know, how do how do you think people can internalize it or internalize some of it uh, and actually process this? Because there's yeah. it's so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, there's a lot, but um, there are little bits. They're the reminders, and again, a lot of this, you know, a lot of the wisdom is sort of ancient and evergreen. And, I'm just channeling the, the Stoics or whatever, the, the Bible. These are, someone says, like, um, every, everything we're saying has already been said, but nobody was listening, so we have to repeat it. Okay? So, so, so these are just things that have to be, excuse me, have to be repeated. And so, so you're not going to get everything from the first time, but you'll pick up a couple, like you say, one or two, and that's great. And then you can go back later on and... Um, Reread it or be reminded uh, of them again, and 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 so um, yeah, I I don't expect everybody to kind of memorize these and just walk away, but if you get a couple of things that can change your behavior, that's a success, and that's and uh, by the way, not all of these are ever going to pertain to you. I, that's the very last bit of advice. Is advice is like a hat, you try it on. If it doesn't fit, you try another one. So. Don't worry, don't expect that these are all apply to you. It's very hard to give advice generically like this. So get what you want out of it and come back later and you'll probably get something else out of it. What other behavior ones are in the book or that you think of? So there's the tipping performers, there's putting the thing where you oh first look for it. What's another one or two? Um, things like, um, well, this, I mean, I, I, I almost open this up at random. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, that's not so behavior, but maybe it's pertinent to your thing. Is if ask funders for money and they'll give you advice, but ask for advice and they'll give you money. I see this happening all the time. I love that. Weird. Um, so, uh, your enjoyment of travel is inversely proportional to the size of your luggage. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, yeah it's, liberi it's liberating to realize how little you need. So, you really do. No, it is. Your enjoyment will, will, is inversely proportional to how much you're dragging around. Um, when you lead, your real job is to create more leaders, not more followers. Jeff, this, by the way, this is what Jeff Bezos uh, 
told me when he was, uh, uh, came by wired very early in the Amazon days, he said, um, we were asking him about hiring because we were in the same thing as trying to hire. He said, oh, I, was very, I have one thing that I'm looking for when I'm hiring. Um, how good are they at hiring other people? <laughs> and they were growing so fast that that was it. It's like, and, and that's so important. It's like, I'm hiring people that I trust could hire new you know, people that are as good as them or better. And that's a real trick. And he was so wise about that. Um, so like, um, uh, anything you say before the word but does not count. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, figure out what time of day you're most productive and protect that time period. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just, I'm trying to think of another one to, uh, this is sort of interesting. Um, it has to do with kind of thriftiness and, and, and whatnot, but, um, uh, I'm very thrifty and you want to be thrifty and you want to be frugal in all things except in your passions. You select a few interests that you kind of like splurge on and the whole the idea is, is that you're, in fact, you want to be thrifty in order to be able to splurge on your passions. So I'm very, very thrifty except in a couple things where like I'll spend, it doesn't matter. And that's, that's the thing. It's like, what I'm really, really cheap. Um, Books. It's like I see. I just buy books without thinking, and I, I try to go through them. But still, it's like probably not a bad. It's probably not a good habit. And I have a little bit of like that. I've shifted from books a little bit more to uh, workshop tools. Where um, before I used to really wrestle over whether I wanted, you know, this pliers. But now it's like, no, 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 this pliers, get the pliers, <laughs> get the pliers. Do you, do you uh, right. well, I'll come back on the question, but I'll save it for you. With, with this book and things in general, you've seen a lot. I, I was curious, what did you, what did you get wrong about the feature and what did you get right? Oh my right? gosh. Because I guess I was curious, like, what did you think would happen, would not yeah, happen yeah, yeah, happen? Yeah, 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 yeah. The opposite. So, um, Wired is coincidentally 30 years old as of last month. 30 years. And at the 25 year uh, anniversary, I actually went back and looked at the early Wires and Time Magazine, all the other magazines that were operating right there to kind of see what we were expecting. Specifically to see what Wired, and Wired uh, got our expectations about about what we were expecting the internet to be were wrong, and what we were kind of expecting, according to you know what was in the magazines, was um, what I would call better TV. It was we thought that there would be like five hundred channels that you could download with all kinds of amazing content being generated, maybe even 5,000 channels. And that they would be, there would be specialized things and you'd be downloading all the stuff. And what we did not really get right was the idea that the content would be almost primarily user generated. Like YouTube. Like YouTube. And that there would be like a million plus channels and that, you know, Twitter, who writes Twitter? Twitter's written by the users. It's the social media are all completely user generated. Now, that, to be fair to us, at Wired, we did try that. We, we had Hot Wired very early within the third year, and we tried to have, we hired Ho Howard Rangel to, to do the user generated um, web news or web content and but it didn't work and so so um, I, I think we were trying that possibility but we just um, we got it wrong 
Um, it, it wasn't working then, and it just seemed like um, you know, like we ourselves, Wired, were were generating content, and you know, we were imagining to be more things like Wired, new startups, thousands of them generating the content, um, and that was wrong because the main event was this bottom-up, user-generated, many-to-many. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that, we're, that was wrong about. I was wrong, you know, in a kind of trivial way, uh, when eBay first started. I just didn't get it. I just thought, auction, well, because it was auction-based, and, and I was never, I mean, I didn't really ever resonate with auctions, so I thought, auctions for stuff, I don't see that ever going anywhere. And um, I was wrong about that. Um, and yeah, so there, so so kind of in small small things, I, uh, I was wrong about. It. I think I, where I was right was um, I wrote a book called "The New Rules of the New Economy" in nineteen seventy eight, and I think some of those things about following the free, the role of the free and freemiums being important, were were right, and the network economics, the whole idea that you have a network effects and these um, the bigger get bigger and that there's this natural monopolies I think those I think all that kind of stuff was correct so there were there was there were a number of kind of larger themes that I think um, we were right about um, but there are plenty of, of uh, missteps along the way I think it's a whole episode about thinking about what what it is that we can understand to keep calibrating to call things like I, you know, for me, I was like, oh, Facebook, I can see that being big, or Mint.com, or yeah. even what AppSumo is, and some of these things, and definitely also have wrong ones. Sure, um, I think that's a, that's a whole separate episode. Um, a few things I definitely want to get your opinion on. How do you choose a life partner? Hmm. So, my wife and I've been married for thirty-five years. Nice. Um, we have three kids. We kind of knew each other for maybe five years before that. We weren't really dating. Um, we had an engagement. And I was probably, I was 35 or 36. We had an engagement and we called it off because it wasn't working out. Um, that we broke up, which was really pretty devastating. Um, but six months later, we tried again and it worked. So I don't know if my advice is very good. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. I have no idea uh, how to choose a life partner. I, I didn't date. Uh, I didn't date in high school. I, didn't, I never, you know, so it's like, I have no idea. I just, uh, yeah. Um, I, 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 I might say something that I don't know if I can have enough time to expand, but basically when we got married, after breaking up, we had an arranged marriage that we arranged ourselves. So, um, so I, all I can say is I don't think I have very good advice. Maybe what is one thing or two to help you stay together okay. for 35 years? So again, this may not apply to anybody else, but I decided pretty early on that my wife is always right and that that's what I do is she's always right I just say you're right and we'll go this way and happy wife happy life so it's, it doesn't it happens to be that my wife is much smarter than me and that um, she has more common sense than anybody I've ever met and that's why I trust her common sense. So um, for me, this has worked out. I could easily see it not working out for everybody. But again, I don't have, you know, it's like, but, but I do believe that um, it is good if everyone's, if, if you, if the two partners would rotate with the, with the periods of time where their partner is always right. Mm, I like that. You can't go back. No, this year. Just once. This, no, this, this, <laughs> this year, you're always right. Next year, I'm always right. But this idea of surrendering to that, I think, is part of what we had to overcome after breaking up was that kind of acceptance 
Um, I like that. And so, um, uh, yeah, um, I think we have, you know, the, the, like a lot of partners, there's, so, so my, my, this is also something else in my advice, is that you, you, when you have a partner, whether it's marriage or business partner, you actually aren't really looking for someone that you um, never disagree with. You actually want to find someone that you enjoy and disagree with. Okay, because you're going to disagree. It's like, it's more important, it's like how do you disagree? What is that? What is that process? What is that temperament? What is the temperature? What is that? What does that feel like? Because you want to be able to disagree in some kind of level of, of joy. I like that. Um, so the first thing I thought of is like the, the woman I'm seeing, she, we're, we're going somewhere and she, a lot of times she wants to, weirdly enough, I have exceptional orientation. Uh-huh. She wants to give me a few things. Sure, sure, one. right. A lot of times when we go somewhere, she's like, I think we gotta go right. Yeah, and I'm like, like no. Let's go right. <laughs> so I think that, thank you for that advice. Um, this weekend I'm going to go away and do a solo camping trip. Okay. For solitude. Yep. And what are questions you think I should be reflecting on about life? Mm. Well, first of all, I commend the, you know, the kind of the retreat. It's kind of the retreat. Um, well, I think I would I would review the question that I, I asking earlier. Let's pretend the fairy godmother waves a magic wand and you wake up with a billion dollars in your bank account. What would you do? What would you do with that? Um, the other thing that's also, I, I, that I actually did myself, was I had an assignment to, to live for six months. And so I went through that, actually let, went through the, the six months with expecting it to die at the end. And so, um, Six months to live. Yeah, I found that very, very um, crystallizing of things because during that six months, I have no, you have no future. You have to kind of be really in the present, and um, you kind of think about what's what's important. Um, I would say also um, here here's something that also I'm very very sure of, and this is from my own experience so far, and that is. I'm certain that there are things that I am wrong about and that may even be cringeworthy of um, descendants in the future. They may look back and kind of cringe at things that I believed because they were either embarrassing or wrong. And the question, so I'm always asking myself, what am I wrong about? And that might be another thing. It's like, what am I wrong about right now that I just don't see or maybe in the future will come to regard as being embarrassing? And so um, that's a very hard thing because obviously, you know, but, but you can, um, you might be in the process of changing your mind about it. That's one place to look at is where have I begun to change my mind about something? Um, so, um, one of the kind of other questions, um, you know, the fundamental quest of trying to be the only, and what do I do better, and that, you know, that's sort of the um, Tim Ferriss question of, um, what do I find easy that others, that others people find hard, right? So, 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 so what, do, what, what do I do that other people are kind of like amazed at? That? For me, it's like sleep. I'm the world's best sleeper. Like, I sleep like a robot. So, um, I'm not sure there's much I can do with that, but that is something that I do really easy. And there are other things that, that might be more useful that you find really easy, like you're saying orientation, that others find difficult. And kind of you, you could work through that list. Well done. I have two last things. One, how are you? How do you feel about death as you've gotten older? How do, I feel how do, you, what? How do you reflect or feel about death as you've gotten death? older? Death? Yeah, as you've gotten older. Okay. Um, as I said, I had the experience of actually living with only six months to live as an assignment, and um, I had a kind of a rebirth experience. So I, I kind of feel like I've already rehearsed that. So um, I believe I can accept it, although I'm not ready for it. So uh, so so I'm not kind of worked up with the fact that I will die 
not only died, the thing about death is not just that you're dead, it's also the fact that very, very likely memory of you will be forgotten within two generations. No one's going to even remember that you were here. Unless you're very exceptional, and maybe there's a couple other generations that don't remember, but you'll be completely forgotten. It's like, think about your great, great grandparents. It's like, who? And so, um, so that's, so there's, there's two kinds of death. There's the death of your body and your consciousness, but there's also the death, the fact that, that, that you're going to be forgotten, which for some people is even a harder one to accept. So, so um, yeah, I, I, but I've actually been aware of this all my life, and maybe that's part of my calmness or centeredness, but I had been very aware of it for, for my entire life that this is part of why we're here. So I see of this as kind of, I wrote a graphic novel, a long graphic novel that I did with some people at Pixar and ILM, and it was about angels and robots. And the basic premise was that um, there are these kind of celestial realms where there are these intangible beings and those tangible beings um, are our souls as humans, and they're kind of like delivered to us when we're born. So, so these intangible beings, and they all crave embodiment. They're disembodied. They're kind of like made out of light. They're disembodied, and they're all incredibly jealous of every person on this planet who's lived. And the embodiment and the, the total ride they have is kind of this this VR experience of being embodied and having senses and being able to, most importantly, what we have with this life is we get to have impacts on other people because we're physical. We can, we can cause things. It's much harder to do in this intangible world to actually have an effect on each other because it's all intangible. But here, it's all tangible. So we can, we can, we can hit somebody, we can save somebody, we can make somebody laugh. There, there we have is this, this this matrix, this substrate, this embodiment, and that's so powerful. And they are looking at us and they're weeping because we're squandering it. They're saying, my gosh, if I was, had a body, I'd be, you know, I'd be taking hot baths and I'd be drooling with mango juice and I would be doing all these things and yet you guys, are, you're complaining, whatever it is. And so they're just weeping at the fact that most of us are squandering this this ride that we have, this time to have maximum impact on others. And so um, that comes to an end. So it's a very short ride. And then I've always been, all my life, been very aware of how short that ride is. And shorter for others, of course. And so I have a countdown clock. I made a countdown clock on my computer and um, I figured out the, um, the average actuarial statistical uh, death for my person born in the year I was, which, which is very known, of course, how insurance works and the, the government has these tables. And then I turned that into a number of days. And it shows how many days I have left on average. And man, does that focus you. So I have 5,082 days, something like that, left on average for a person born my age. So like I, I have all this stuff I want to need to do in 5,000 days. It's like, okay, today really has to count because they, you know, it's another 5,000 days. And so um, actually Matt Brainy took that idea for Futurama. He did a Futurama episode based on that clock. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very cognizant of, of the shortness and the fact that, that we have. And I think for me, thinking in terms of days has been very, very galvanizing and um, I don't take a, a single one of them for uh, granted. When, when you look back at your, your life, what, what regrets do you have? Um, not very many. And as I say in the book, most regrets are about things you didn't do rather than the things that you did. And 
the one thing, that, which I've said other times, um, we wanted and tried to have a fourth kid, and we didn't. And I would have loved to have more kids. I really regret that we didn't, didn't have more kids. Because, first of all, the kids love siblings, at least in our case. And um, I grew up with one of five. My wife grew up with one of five. Uh, my parents were one of seven. So we had lots of cousins. And our kids have lots of cousins, too. And uh, for me, there's just a huge net gain from having as many kids as you could possibly can. There's no issue about overpopulation, it's quite the opposite. We're headed toward population implosion in another 50, another 30 years. So um, uh, you should have, so I, re, I really wish we had more kids because it would have been great. So I'm trying to think of the question, it's opposite of regrets. What are all the, what are a few of the moments <laughs> that you're like, fuck yeah, I made that call. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's a great thing. Um, yeah, for my my travel early, I'm so glad that I traveled in, when I was young in the twenties, and not waited until retire or whatever. I'm never going to retire, but I mean, I'm so glad that I traveled when I was young. That was just so so right. I actually thinking regrets. I regret having gone to college for one year. That was. I wish I'd never gone to college at all, even for that year. I would, wish I'd started a year earlier traveling. Um, what else did it, it was right? Well, turned out that, you know, I was lucky that Wired was the actually right call. I mean, it was fun. It was great. Um, we were in the spotlight. Most of those things were, were really, really good. That was a good call. Um, I Again, I was lucky with my wife that um, that we made it work and we decided to go even though it was um, uh, kind of a little rocky in the beginning. And um, 